welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, it's Bang Kachukchi and Yeeha. Texas Tim Pilbeen is trying to play underlevers like a banjo. First, we're stalking Muntjac, but a disease carrying, blood sucking parasite is stalking us. This is where the hunter becomes the hunted. If you're a stalker, you've probably heard about Lyme's disease. You might even know someone who's had it. It can be life-changing. It's a terrible disease, and when you have it uh, one or two years, it influences your whole life. The ticks that carry Lyme's are not just targeting people with rifles. It can be hikers, cyclists, campers, anyone who loves being outside. All aspects of the stalk are dangerous for ticks, really. Today, we want to understand a bit more about ticks and Lyme's disease. We're joining the guys from Rovin's Clothing. Back in 2006, having contracted Lyme's while out stalking, Vincent Janssen started a long journey to develop an effective barrier so he could stalk with confidence. It's not only a problem for a few people, no, it's a problem for all people in the different countries in Europe, because in all those countries we have ticks, in all those countries we have the Lyme disease, and the new, new disease, the, the tick-borne encephalitis. Prevention is better than cure, especially with something as unpredictable as Lyme's disease. When it hits the garment, it will directly be disorientated. It won't bite anymore, it can't bite anymore. And that's the way Rovent is very effective. Not only falling off, but immediately when it touches the, the clothing, it can't bite anymore. This morning we're in Oxfordshire on the glorious Cornbury Park estate. Dear manager Tom Marshall is taking Robbins' man in the UK, Darren Bullock, out after Muntjac. But these two are left to wander by. How old do you think it will be, Tom? A week at best, I would imagine. It's a rare treat to see the young. Sights like this make getting up early a lot easier. Darren is an engineer by trade and a seasoned stalker. He's also pretty clued up about ticks. Today he's going to tell us a little bit about this beast in the undergrowth and why he got involved with introducing specialist anti-tick clothing into the UK. A colleague of mine, he actually picked a tick, a tick up on the, some of the deer he brought home and his daughter picked up a tick which was quite a concern for us because she was young, too young to have any sort of treatment for any tick-borne diseases. So that made us really think, not only for ourselves but for family and friends, that you might actually put at risk. So that set me looking for a, a solution to the problem. Um, we had some German guys come over that were wearing the clothing. I liked the look of it and I got hold of some myself, started using it, seeing it, the benefits from it. So then I spoke to Vincent about bringing it into the UK. His friend's daughter getting a tick was a wake-up call for Darren. His ground has a high tick burden, but levels vary all over the country. He explains a good way of finding out just how rife they are. What most people do is to walk along with a white sheet on the end of a stick. You basically drag, drag the sheet along. When you get to the end of the patch of ground, you flip the sheet over, and then any of the ticks that have attached to that white sheet are highly visible. Obviously that gives you a number that you can count and then you can see how many ticks are in that area. It's a muggy morning with a threat of rain, but it's a beautiful part of the world. One problem we will have today is the height of the grass. The small munchak have good cover. This one appears on the bank above us. Darren tries to get himself into position, but she's off. A bit further on, we spot another. Tom suggests to Darren there might be a chance before she reaches the top of the bank. She's down. It's a nice chest shot, but does she have any ticks? Not this time. She's a healthy looking animal, but it doesn't mean we should be complacent. When the animal's been shot, as soon as the blood stops pumping, any ticks that are on the animal, obviously they feel that their feed's being stopped. So that's when they're looking to get off and join something else. You're the next person that touches that animal, so any ticks that are 
evacuating the animal are going to look for you straight away. Uh, so yeah, you definitely pick ticks up as soon as the animal is shot. And also back in the larder, when the animal starts cooling down, you see another load of ticks come off it. The ticks that you probably had not even seen on the animal. All aspects of the store are dangerous for ticks, really. Good result, Tom. Hard work. You often hear people say that they didn't spot a tick for a few days, that they settle into our nooks and crannies. Darren's heard them all. We find the majority of tick bites are around the waist area. They're latching onto the front of your legs or your lower leg. They're crawling up the trouser. Uh, and then the first place really they can get into the body is in and over the waistband. Although you get them all over, I mean, you know, people have them on the neck, on the back. Uh, they have them in some very, very personal places as well, which is, is very, very common. And if you do find a tick, correct removal is the most important thing. Even though I wear this gear, I'm still always looking on myself for ticks. And I always carry uh, an Atomic Tick Twister. And if I do find one, which since I've been wearing the Robins gear, I haven't, although that sounds silly, but uh, then obviously that's the method I would use for removal. Back at base, Tom sorts out the munchak. As a deer manager, he knows colleagues who are suffering with tick-borne diseases. Getting tired, whether it be taking the dog for a walk or going stalking, um, and not being able to carry out daily duties like they should be able to. Um, tiredness, weariness, eye problems, blindness, um, all things like that really. The industry is pretty clued up these days. The National Gamekeepers' Organisation endorses Robin's clothing. The World Health Organisation has also given it the thumbs up. The clothing may be unpleasant for ticks, but not for us. The permethrin, the product, the substrate we use in the product, need to be balanced between bioactivity to ticks, and not only to ticks, but also midges and mosquitoes, and besides the uh, the safety of environment and also your own skin, your own body. So that's a balance and we could only do that uh, due to a fantastic uh, polymer coating. And the polymer coating is the, the way of getting that balance, that norm. Germany has a big tick problem and it's not just the hunting community needing protection. A big forestry commission, natural trust organisations, uh, University of Wageningen, eh, we worked a lot with. We need those organisations for developing our products, but we also help them with protecting them against those ticks. If you want more information about Rovins clothing and ticks and Lyme's disease, please visit rovins.co.uk. And if you'd like to go stalking on the Cornbury estate, please drop Tom a line via cornburypark.co.uk. Right from one blood-sucking parasite to another, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Mega group Metallica are headlining the Glastonbury Festival this year, but the Antis want them out. Metallica frontman James Hetfield is an enthusiastic shooter and can be heard on US TV narrating a bear hunting programme for the History Channel. Bad buzzard news for gamekeepers. The National Gamekeepers Organisation has reacted with dismay to Natural England's decision to reject the control of a small number of buzzards on a shoot where pheasant poults are being devastated by the birds. The species is increasing faster in number than virtually any other wild bird. June is National Microchipping Month in the UK. The Kennel Club has uploaded this video to remind dog and cat owners to make sure their microchip details are up to date. For dogs in the UK, microchipping will be compulsory from April 2016. An animal welfare group has come up with another reason to scare the public. The RSPCA warns that raccoon dogs are being bought, found unsuitable as pets and then released into the British countryside. The organisation says it's picked up five runaway raccoon dogs, two in Wales and three in Kent, and fears more will soon be let loose. The popular Pigeon Watch Forum has held its fifth annual North versus South charity clay shoot. 84 members of the forum slogged it out over 100 birds sporting. Top Gun with 87 was Katamong, a southerner. However, northerners produced more consistent shooters and won the annual trophy for the fifth time in five years. The shoot raises money for the Orchid Cancer Charity, Great Ormond Street and Different Strokes. And this year's £5,000 brings the five-year total to more than £21,000. The Australian state of Victoria is having millions of dollars spent on it as a tourism destination for overseas trophy hunters. 
punting is worth 439 million Australian dollars to the state economy and support almost three and a half thousand full-time jobs directly and indirectly across Victoria, according to a survey by the Department of Environment and Primary Industry. Victoria's 46,000 licensed game shooters mainly hunt deer, duck, quail and feral pests. The government plans to invest $17.6 million in game management over the next four years. America is a step closer to allowing moderators. The governor of Louisiana has signed into law a bill allowing hunting with suppressors. The bill sailed through, passing the Senate unanimously on May the 20th, with little comment by lawmakers. Suppressors are now legal to use in hunting in 33 states. And finally, Henk van der Berg was bow hunting in Namibia when he heard guinea fowl chattering outside his blind. Believing the birds were reacting to a predator, he peeked out of the shooting window and came face to face with a leopard. Frozen in fear for a second, he quickly clapped his hands, causing the leopard to back away. Instead of running, it scent marked a tree before leaving. The video is a bit shaky, but you can understand why. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now from news about them to what you lot have been up to, it's Hello Charlie. Hello Charlie, just enjoying the last bit of duck shooting of the season. Got a reasonable bag for the day. Hello Charlie, it's Paul up here in Scotland. I've just shot a nice little roebuck, but I've just had to drag it 30 metres out of that. Hello Charlie. Vera and Lassie in Denmark preparing for a new food pl plot with uh, cover crops. Hi Charlie, nice, uh, nice evening on the rabbits this evening. Got a few in the bag, a couple for the pot anyway. Not a bad evening, eh? Not a bad evening. You See ya Charlie. See ya Charlie. Hello Charlie, Jamie Rose here in Hexton, out doing a bit more rabbit shooting. Got one so far. See, see. Hi, hi Charlie. Send us your own Hello Charlie, film yourself on your mobile phone, just a sentence saying Hello Charlie, who you are and what you're up to. Then share it or email it via YouTube, Facebook, Dropbox or you send it, you name it, to charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Next up, Tim Pillbeam is testing his trigger finger with underleavers. Today, Tim is getting all yee-haw on us with a couple of underlever rifles. The grand pappy is the Uberti 73, supplied by shooting and gun collector specialist Henry Crank. It's a replica of one of the guns that claim it won the West, the Winchester 1873. It's a rifle apparently responsible for putting more meat on the American table than any other firearm. You will hear the same story from lots of other firearm firms. The other offering is the ultra-modern ultralight Browning BLR in 308. This is the popular tool in Australia, New Zealand and America. Perfect for quick fire, big pest control. Joining Tim down the range is his friend Stephen Higgs, a firearms expert with a lifetime of rifle experience. The lever action rifle. What do you know about that, Stephen? Well, basically it's, it's a historical firearm. Uh, it goes back a long time into the 1800s in, in the States and it's used for presently for target shooting and it's getting quite popular in the UK in indoor ranges who are capable of handling the calibers in 357, um, 38 Special and so on. They're, okay. they're common calibers used indoors in ranges. Um, and of course in different formats, these are used in, in America certainly as a, a starter gun. Virtually everyone who starts shooting gets one of these as a as a present from his mum and dad, uh, and huge numbers are involved. They are accurate, they're used in target ranges. I've seen them used um, at sort of five, six hundred metres out on really? the down targets. Really? Wow, wow. Um, and beyond in some cases where you've got the larger calibres. This is a sporting one which is 24 inches long. A lot of them are short 18 inch uh, uh, barrels. But uh, it's just a very unusual one. It's got a pistol grip, most of them have straight stocks. Uh, very, very, very good quality bit of uh, European uh, walnut. So, uh, yeah, a bit different, isn't it? Isn't it? This BLR is in 308, 20 inch barrel, and it's just over six pounds. So, it's going to be in 308, it's going to be quite feisty, isn't it? It should be. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> okay. It's for walking, picking targets, and 
and shoots me. Very much fr uh, uh, Absolutely. freehand. Freehand. Rifle, yeah. And also, unusual for under lever, he's actually got his detachable magazine. magazine. And uh, ammunition. We haven't talked about ammunition, have we? So this one would take normal hunting ammunition. Normal hunting ammunition. Uh, it's not a fast twist barrel. It won't fire sort of 180 grain. You're about 150, 147, 150 grain ammunition is ideal for it. And of course, that's where a lot of the 308 hunting ammunition is made. So, those are the rifles. Let's see how fast and accurate they can be. Tim has been sent some PPU ammo for the Uberti, which is top ejecting, so open sights only. And Tim and Stephen are going to start at 40 yards, shooting at five targets from left to right. The fastest wins. Now, before they start, this is how they do it stateside. Hmm. After that, Stephen and Tim might seem a bit pedestrian, but everyone has to start somewhere. I think a lot of practice involved in this, isn't there? Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, it is, yeah. Ow. That pretty hurt, that did. I wear my gloves there, you see, hang on. That's what they, that's what they do, isn't it? Put my gardening gloves on. <laughs> Ow. Oh, Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Work in progress, I think. The chaps try and pick up speed on the big steel target, but I think we should revisit this in a decade or so. Next, let's have a bash with the Browning. We drop back to 70 yards and again work from left to right. Tim has a near clear round, but he's struggling to recover the sight picture after each shot. That wasn't bad. First shot was good. Second shot I just pulled far too early. First shot absolutely plumb. Fourth shot was pretty good and the fifth shot was pretty good. But it's that technique of actually reloading and re-aiming. It's quite a skill to actually hold that rifle steady at the same time as restarting the, the, the round. That's a, quite a skill, actually. Yours goes, Stephen. The Browning is a very pointable rifle, and Tim and Stephen think it could be a useful driven game gun. Whether you'd be invited back to Germany if you turned up with one is another thing, but with Tim's style of bore shooting, we're safe. Stephen goes first, and the underlever is clearly having an American influence. <laughs> that is, that is well, you see your first shot? Oh, yes. <laughs> The boar is being shot, just not necessarily in the right places. The guys finish off with the Uberti. So, after a few hours of underlever action, are they underwhelmed or left wanting more? Let's start with the, the Uberti 357. Very, very different rifle, oh. different technique. Uh, how do you find it? I thought it was great fun to use on ranges like this and the moving target. It was easy to handle yeah. uh, and a good plinking rifle really at this sort of thing. But you still have to concentrate very hard and practice. There's yeah. no doubt that uh, you need some skill yeah. and develop some skill in handling the rifle to shoot it, to shoot it well on this sort of target. Yeah. Pistol based ammo, so the recoil is, is very low. The velocities aren't terribly high. It's, it's not really a hunting rifle. It is ideal for this sort of Amazing. this sort of shooting yeah so how do we go on the browning then Stephen browning for this sort of shooting perhaps not ideal it's a lot more difficult to handle but let's be fair this is a hunting rifle uh, it's not intended for for use rapid firing on a on a small range um, but having said that I think it does make a really nice hunting rifle actually, I, I, I have to I'm say. really I'm really 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 yeah. pleased with that I, I feel that I can actually quite happily have one of those. The Uberti and Browning have both impressed Tim and Stephen. They just need to put a bit more time on the range. And somehow I don't think they'll have a problem with that. Right from the Wild West to the rest of the world of hunting and shooting, it is Hunting YouTube. <laughs> 
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Let's start with Worthy, the Yorkshire Clay Days 2014. In aid of the Prince's Trust, the 15th event was held at Mulgrave Estate near Whitby by kind permission of Lord Normanby. This is a jolly film about the day. Now more useful, this film shows how, if you shoot a lot of pigeons and use them all as decoys, you can scare off the other pigeons instead of making them decoy better. Next up, here's something unusual from the North American Hunting Channel. It shows top British shooting instructor Chris Bather visiting Gunmakers Row at the British CLA Game Fair and admiring the shotguns. Field Sports Channel viewer Christian Corti recommends his channel and especially this film, Kudu Hunting in the Karoo. It shows a young Kudu bull shot at Wilgerbosch Hunting Reserve. You can hear the excitement of everyone in the shooting party. Nice work. Another viewer, Ulrich Orskov from Denmark, emails with a few of his films. His most recent shows boar hunting in Australia with a recurve bow. It gives a great sense of the mood and a wonderful view of the stork. For a different take on pig hunting, here is Pork Down on the Ground from American Outdoor Hub Hunting. Sometimes George Georgia deer hunting turns into hog hunting. This big boar steps into the field instead of a deer, and his number is up. For a channel that's a bit more reliable on the deer front, you can't beat Waika Rimawana in New Zealand. In this film, Hunting Red Deer Part 73. For long range shooting on a spiker like this, they recommend a 2506 for reliability with a barrel of at least 27 inches. And finally, we are in the Alps with a GoPro camera after Chamois. They are truly dons and cadre magnifique in a beautiful setting. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you are missing the fishing films and the air gun films, watch our new shows, Airheads and Fishing Britain. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, if none of those take your fancy, how about one of these? In Airheads, James Marchington's peanut butter is bringing in all sorts of diners, and here's one that didn't pay the bill. Oh dear. Darren is clearing the dockside grain saws of ferals, plus we have the rest of the gang bringing their air gunning exploits to the party. Click on the link on the screen to watch the show. In Fishing Britain, we visit a bass master in Pembrokeshire. Matt Powell guides people bass fishing and then treats them to a fine dining experience made from fresh seafood, wild mushrooms and, well, whatever else he can find in the hedgerows. His punters do not wind up the same way as James Marchington's squirrel. And Schools Challenge TV brings you all the fun of the Browning Open 2014 at the Oxford Gun Company. Thousands of pounds worth of prizes up for grabs and big name shooters competing including Mickey Rice, Chris Childerhouse and Stephen Walton. Well we are back next week and if you're watching this on YouTube please don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button somewhere around the outside of the screen or go to our webpage fieldsportschannel.tv where you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or pop your email address into our constant contact box and we'll constantly contact you about our programme that's at 7pm every Wednesday. This has been Fieldsports Britain. Goodbye, good hunting, good shooting and good fishing. <laughs>